Welcome, everyone, to our webinar on business model innovation in the American marketplace. We're thrilled that you can review our webinar, which we've done on behalf of Techies, the Finnish Funding Agency for Innovation, and FinPro. My name is Chris Coulter. I'm the CEO of Globescan, and Globescan is an international research consultancy focused on stakeholder and consumer intelligence. And we have done a great deal of research over the past 25 years related to the role of business in society. And my name is Lindsay Clinton. I'm a director at Sustainability in New York. Sustainability is a think tank and consultancy with offices in London, New York, and San Francisco. And we work with multinational companies to help them uh, become leaders on the sustainability agenda. And recently, we've done research into business model innovation, and we're looking forward to sharing some of our insights with you today. Today, Lindsay and I will go through a number of elements that we hope help Finnish companies orient themselves towards the American marketplace and are able to be more successful in the U.S., um, given the, the vibrancy of that economy. And we'll look at four parts in today's session. First of all, we'll introduce some of the background of our approach to our research into business innovation in the U.S. marketplace. Then we'll focus on the demand side. How are consumer attitudes and behavior shifting, and what are the implications for uh, companies understanding that marketplace in the U.S.? We'll then move into the supply side of of this conversation, and Lindsay will take us through some exciting work that she and sustainability have been doing around business model innovation and all the various new forms of business models that are evolving and cropping up in the U.S. marketplace and what that means for companies learning to um, adapt to the American marketplace. And we'll end on some implications, implications for business, an overview of how the consumers uh, meet with the new business types of models, and five key points for you to take away. So let's begin with the introduction and approach. Quite simply, we've been both separately, GlobeScan and Sustainability have been doing interesting research programs into the demand side and the supply side, respectively. And we wanted to showcase some of that recent research that we've both been doing. And, and both of us feel they're, in their own respects, quite breakthrough and innovative in their implications. And we wanted to go through that quite simply with you. The intention and the objective of this project was to help support Finnish companies be more successful, understand the American marketplace dynamics more clearly, and help them intervene with their own model of innovation as well as understanding what consumers expect um, in the U.S. And we are looking at Globescan on some research that we've been doing. We've been doing lots of public opinion tracking research in the U.S. around the world for the past 15 years. And more recently, we've conducted some exciting market research with some companies and a brand agency called BBMG and Sustainability to understand what is the new consumer segment that are ready for the type of business that the world requires and, and quite a focus on sustainability. On the supply side, Lindsay and sustainability have done some fantastic work into reviewing existing business models, new business models, and categorizing them into different types, um, which she will share with us today to help us understand where the opportunities are for different types of companies. So let's begin with the demand side, getting to know the American consumer. We've been reviewing and, and, and tracking American public opinion, consumer expectations, consumer behavior for many years. And, and here's a, a short um, highlight of what we've understood. First of all, Americans, like other consumers in the world, have significant expectations for business. They are expecting business to conduct their affairs in a very responsible way. They are looking for business to stimulate the economy and create jobs. They're looking for business to generate more sustainable 
um, lifestyles and to address some of the impacts that business has in social, environment, and economic perspectives. So a very significant level of expectations, and those have grown over the past 15 years. At the same time, we have very significant levels, low levels of trust in companies. So high expectations, but low trust for companies to deliver on those elements, which makes it challenging. Secondly, we see that consumers are interested and understand the need to consume differently. And they, while they consume significantly products and services, they don't feel completely settled around that. They're looking for new opportunities to consume better and differently in many respects. And that comes from a personal sense, an individual sense of responsibility. They understand they have a role to play in improving economic, environmental, and social impact, and they're looking for ways to do that. They're having sometimes a difficult time in the marketplace to identify differences between companies, between business models, or between products and services that allow them to do that. We know when we're, if we look at the, the topic of sustainable consumption, that consumers have um, three macro issues that they try and attend to <clears throat> as they try and shift their consumer behavior. One, of course, is the no of price and quality and value for price, and that's a challenging situation because we've been taught um, that price is so fundamental to consumers. Secondly is performance, product service performance, the, compromise, the potential compromise of various attributes around the quality of the product or service continues to linger as a challenge in trying to overcome and credibility of new offers when it comes to sustainable products and services. The credibility issue is, is paramount. And given overall low trust in business is a significant issue. So being able to engage and communicate authentically and credibly with transparency is a critical element for companies in the U.S. marketplace. Fourth, when people are, are when we're asking consumers what are they looking for from companies to focus on, um, some some very simple but important issues pop up. One being water, how critical water is, and as a element of environmental integrity, especially in different regions such as the southwest of the United States, are, are top of mind for many consumers. Helping promote wealth and health and wellness is also a critical responsibility that consumers are placing on companies and looking to them to try and help improve the health and wellness of themselves and their families. Uh, fairness, equality, um, transparency, these are all critical elements. And given the low trust of business, trying to demonstrate the, the, the fact that um, as a company, you're committed to being open, honest, and fair with consumers and the public is absolutely critical. And finally, in these ongoing challenging economic times, there's no, there's no surprise that consumers are also looking for jobs and economic activity from business when it comes to responsibilities. Lastly, if we, we know that consumers are increasingly, and I think at an early part of the curve, getting excited about trying to collaborate more fully with business and participating with business in creating new service and product offerings and helping implement some of the challenges that they understand and being a proactive partner in trying to conceive and ideate some of the solutions going forward. Let's, let's begin and we'd like to share with you a few of the research findings we have to tell the story a little bit. And one important piece of the puzzle is this level of trust which I've referred to. And we can see here a list of different types of public and private institutions operating in, in the U.S. And we see these as a net trust level. So we ask the question of consumers, how much do you trust each of these types of institutions to operate in the best interest of society? And we have created a net trust index here where people who trust the institutions minus those who don't trust them leaves us with a certain level of an index. So scientific and academic institutions have a very high degree of trust among Americans and a plus 69 rating of trust, so quite significant. Follow that are our non government organizations, NGOs, with a plus 33 rating. The United Nations in the US also not um, relatively well trusted at a plus seven. And then we get into negative trust territory with national companies, national governments, global companies, and the press and media. 
it's important to recognize that the trust levels of business are below and behind NGOs and academic and scientific institutions. In a public policy debate, for example, when we're discussing issues like sustainability, economic development, um, these agencies who are very, very values driven or scientifically objectively driven have much higher levels of trust and debate with business. So this is shaping the discourse and also the public policy arena in many cases in the US and other parts of the world. We can see trust in global companies is lower than trust in American companies. So for Finnish companies coming to the marketplace, being a foreign company leaves you at a disadvantage. And that's, an, that's a strategic uh, implication for foreign companies operating in the US market. The, the solution is to demonstrate clearly that you care about the American marketplace, you're committed to some of the concerns and expectations that Americans have, and you're also able to partner and collaborate with different institutions that have higher levels of trust, like academic institutions, like scientists, like NGOs and charities. And that collaborative partnership element is an important way to build trust immediately and simply with the general public. We've created an exciting new segmentation to help understand the American uh, marketplace, and that this was in conjunction with our colleagues at Sustainability and BBMG, and we began this two years ago. Um, and, and one of the critical elements in the overarching business case for why business should be responsible, should be sustainable, and what is the return on investment for that type of responsibility one of the weakest parts of the business case certainly has been the consumer response and marketplace. And so what we wanted to do was, was create a, a new understanding of different types of consumers in the U.S. population and see which, which segments are most relevant for the sustainability and responsibility debate, which ones are most engaged on corporate and brand activity in this space, and where are the opportunities for business to try and connect with consumers and, and respond to demand among consumers? So this, this segmentation bubble map is a result of that work. It's based on a survey initially of 6,000 people across six countries, and it's been subsequently done in 22 countries <clears throat> two more times. So a very significant amount of data and knowledge we're building on these different types of segments. And, and the segmentation was, in its first instance, was quite rigorous. It was based on 450 variables and some significant statistical techniques to try and identify these segments. And so the, the model is, is very powerful and clear. And out of the research that we did, we found two broad dimensions that drive attitudes or behaviors of consumers. And on the vertical axis of this matrix, you can see we've labeled one of these dimensions materialism. It's actually more than materialism. It also includes style and substance and reflects people's desire to consume, their love of shopping, their engagement and interest in brands. And we can see on that axis, we have the aspirational at the very top as being the highest and most intense on this materialism style engagement axis. The horizontal axis is one we call sustainability. That includes social and environmental issues, levels of engagement and attitude related to the social environmental agenda. And we can see two different segments score highly on that axis, including the aspirational and the advocates. And out of the, all of this research, we can describe each of these four segments um, in ways that are relevant for business. So first of all, on the left-hand side of the matrix, we have the indifferent, who are consumers interested in consumption to a certain degree, but not interested whatsoever in the sustainability agenda. And we know that these are relatively younger males who are somewhat indifferent to the broader, broader agenda, and we also know they're not terribly influential in public policy debates. In the middle of the, of the matrix, we have the practicals, who are people, average folks across the country, who are living as they typically do and somewhat engaged in sustainability and somewhat preoccupied with brands, but not terribly so in either case. In the bottom right-hand quadrant, we have a group called the Advocates, who we refer to uh, very much as proxies for the non-governmental organization agenda. 
They are quite focused on the sustainability agenda, have been for a long time. They tend to be somewhat a little bit older than the average American. Um, and they're not interested in the conversation companies might be having on sustainability, and especially brands trying to engage consumers in this way. They believe companies to be broadly the challenge, the problem, rather than the solution. And they're not very influential in deciding and defining the future consumer trends. They're, they're not culturally influential. And that leaves us with the aspirationals, and the aspirationals um, are an exciting new segment that we've identified, and, and they have a, a very simple appeal in that they cover off some key elements. One, they're engaged and focused on the sustainability agenda, almost with the similar extent as the advocates, and that's important, and we think relatively new, uh, a new approach in their trajectory and evolution. Secondly, they are very much into consumerism. They enjoy consuming, they like shopping, they have a taste for style, they like trying new brands. They're early adopters in many cases. They tend to be younger, uh, but not exclusively so. They tend to be more women than men. And they are importantly culturally influential, both especially for the practical, but also for, I think, um, the broader types of business models that will be taking place in the future. So we see them as a very important and realistic um, pers uh, perspective to understand where the future uh, opportunities are for business going forward. And if we look at the size of the aspirational in different parts of the world, in the U.S., 34% of Americans are aspirational. Um, that's a sizable population. We can see that some of the parts of the world are they're overrepresented by aspirational largely because of urban sampling in some countries like China, but also because of the real desire and need for different types of brand and the importance of style and also the experience of challenging environmental issues that they're experiencing in places like Beijing are there. The, the other important note um, to, to make for American aspirational is that they are very much overrepresented in urban centers. We can think of New York and, California and, and Los Angeles and San Francisco and Chicago. Especially, these are cities where aspirationals are in abundance, and that is also what makes them so influential. So to, to summarize the importance of the aspirationals and how it likely ties into some of the business models that Lindsay will be taking us through in a few minutes, we, we want to say that, again, that the aspirationals are critical and strategic because they are leading and influential in trends. And they're, they're very much a cultural force, and we know the potency of culture in trying to scale new types of behaviors and consumption patterns. Secondly, style is really important. So while the environmental pieces and social elements are, are critical, the initial conversation the aspirations are looking for relates to things that are novel, are stylistic, are interesting, are cool, and that needs to be the first point of engagement with aspirational, followed by things such as the values that the, that the company or the product espouses or reflects, and, and how that practically can be applied in many cases. The aspirationals are also important, and one of the reasons why they're culturally influential is that they're very tribal. Being part of a community is critical, virtually or in, in physicality. And their, their ability to create and be a part of communities and influence the broader trends is absolutely fundamental to them being an influential part of the future conversations. And they're also interested in, sh in the shared economy, the maker economy, in developing new approaches and new ways of creating um, value and addressing challenges, all with a sense of optimism and fun and a real belief that the future will be better than it is today. With that, I'll pass it over to Lindsay to take us through the supply side of the conversation. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, so Chris did a great job of walking you through uh, consumer perceptions of companies um, as well as what consumers are thinking about sustainability. And now I'd like to give you a better idea of the business models that are in some way responding to the demands of consumers, as well as in some cases being more anticipatory in nature um, 
so what I'll do is walk you through um, our definition of a business model and then actually give you eight or nine examples of business model innovation that sustainability has seen in its research and, uh, and actually give you quite a few companies to look at that are exhibiting those business model innovations. So first, to fully understand what's happening on the supply side, we have to define what we're looking for. What is a business model? What is a business model innovation? And there are many definitions in the academic literature of business model, but we actually most prefer Alex Osterwalder's definition. He's an academic, and he has come up with this business model uh, canvas. And so this on, on this slide is a snapshot of the canvas. And, uh, and it's pointing out that your business model is, uh, is the fundamental structure with which you create, deliver, and capture value. And that really comprises the entire activity system that is your business. So it's who your customers are, the kinds of relationships that you have with those customers, how you're getting revenue, what the resources are that you're drawing upon. It's really that entire um, activity system. And the definition, again, is, is the fundamental structure with which a business creates, delivers, or captures value. And so a business model innovation is actually a shift in the way that you're creating, delivering, and capturing value. And what we're most interested in for, um, for this presentation, but also for our work overall, is thinking about business model innovations that have more social or environmental impact. Um, and so that's what I'll be talking about today, is actually those specific kinds of innovations that are having um, more sustainable outcomes. And that often happens when value becomes distributed differently um, within and along a company's value chain. So maybe that's with your customers, maybe it's with your employees, with the community, with investors. It can happen in a myriad uh, of ways, but, um, but that's what we'll be looking at today. And this is a framework that sustainability uses to understand where business model innovation fits in terms of value to business and value to society. So on the horizontal axis, you can see that's the measurement of value to business. Um, and on the vertical axis, you can see value to society. And while we think that process innovation and product innovation are necessary, worthwhile, and important, we think that business model innovation actually provides the most value to business and the most value to society. Um, so this is a, a pretty simple framework that we use to help businesses understand on the continuum that once you've kind of got a good handle on process innovation or product innovation, you could start thinking about shifting the, uh, the actual way that you do business. So what I'll do now is walk through these nine different examples of business model innovation that we are seeing in the marketplace. What we've done is divided them into different kinds of innovation or impact. So some models uh, focus more on environmental innovation and impact. Others focus a little bit more on the social side of things. And some are actually innovating in the financing component to, um, to advance environmental solutions or social solutions. And then lastly, we have a category that we call diverse impact. Um, and those models are ones that are maybe having some social and environmental impact um, all at the same time. So first is the closed-loop production model, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, but it, it basically means when a company um, uses the material that creates a product, that's actually they recycle that material through the production system. And so these closed-loop production models present tremendous opportunities for companies to cut costs and also meet their ambitious um, sustainability goals, waste goals, while also impacting the broader system. We've actually seen several Fortune 500 companies experimenting with this model, um, like Maersk, the shipping company, um, Nike, uh, the footwear and apparel company. Um, and they're experimenting with this concept on a product level. Very few companies have actually been able to master the closed loop production model um, within their entire business. But Novellus is an example of a company that has done so. Novellus is an aluminum company based out of Atlanta, Georgia, they uh, create 14% of the world's rolled aluminum products. So that's beverage cans, but it's also architectural structures and consumer electronics. 
And currently, Novella sources 43% of its aluminum from recycled materials, but they have a goal to reach 80% by 2020. Um, and they aim to do that by actually developing an entirely closed loop, almost entirely closed loop business model. Um, they're going to source more recycled aluminum, coordinate post-production take back, arrange end of life product take back, and also build some of its own recycling operations and processing facilities. Obviously not every company can do this because many companies have very complex um, manufacturing systems, but uh, this is a really great example of a company that um, is, is trying to rework their, their entire model based on the system. Another environmental impact model is the physical to virtual model. So the consumer marketplace was once almost exclusively comprised of brick and mortar stores. You have the corner store, the grocery store, the big box store, or maybe even the shopping mall uh, in America. But that model of putting up a, a store on every corner in every town um, is very resource intensive and expensive. So we've seen a lot more companies actually switching to a virtual model because it eliminates brick and mortar infrastructure and dramatically reduces the resources you need to supply a product to a consumer. And as consumers become much more comfortable with engaging with brands in different formats, as alluded to in the aspirational segmentation, um, I think we'll probably start to see fewer retail outposts and more online-only brands, um, like Fresh Direct, which is the company that um, delivers groceries uh, to your door, or Netflix, which many of us are familiar with, um, which is the streaming video company now. Um, so one example here that I've given that you may not know about is Sungevity. They're a global residential solar installation and financing company, and they've really streamlined the way that solar panels are sold to individual customers. Um, they have a very capital light model, and, um, and in order to uh, get solar panels into people's homes across the U.S., they use almost an entirely online model. So it's very low overhead. They provide quotes. They design um, the they design the systems with satellites. So they don't actually need to send anyone out to your house until very late stage of the process. So they've been able to really um, cut a lot of costs and what they're doing, and they, re they reduced inflation costs um, in 2012 by 30 percent. So um, pretty impressive. Next, um, another environmental impact model is rematerialization. So this is when a company takes the source material uh, from a waste stream, and then they actually use it to develop a new output. Um, so companies using this model have actually benefited from an increasing focus on other businesses on reducing their waste, uh, reducing their waste to landfill specifically. So um, a lot of companies now have zero waste to landfill targets, and so they need to figure out other things to do with that waste. And there are a lot of startups um, that are actually capitalizing on this opportunity. Uh, I think the challenge here for consumer-facing businesses is overcoming any consumer pushback against the use of recycled materials. But I think judging from GlobeScan's research, 85% of American consumers prefer buying environmentally friendly products. 77% are willing to pay more for responsibly produced products. And so that suggests that the use of recycled materials could actually be beneficial for a brand rather than a hindrance. Um, there are quite a few companies that are kind of using this model. Um, one in particular uh, that's interesting is waste management. So U.S. company that's providing waste disposal and recycling solutions to divert waste from landfill. But what's unique is that due to their landfill, they have this landfill gas to energy effort, um, and they've been able to recover naturally occurring, occurring gas inside landfills and produce energy as a result. And so they say that they're now producing more than twice the amount of renewable energy, sorry, renewable electricity as the entire U.S. solar industry. Um, so pretty, pretty remarkable. So switching gears a little bit away from the environmental innovation piece and over to social innovation models, um, it, here's a model called inclusive sourcing. So for companies that are sourcing products from small producers, either globally or in the U.S., I think that inclusive sourcing kind of deserves a closer look. 
Um, it can require a little bit more effort and upfront investment on the part of companies, but it can reap dividends in terms of stabilizing the supply chain, building brand loyalty, um, and creating a more economically empowered uh, consumer base. So this really requires retooling a supply chain to make the company more inclusive and focus on supporting the farmer by providing training um, and by providing longer-term contracts. And um, Walmart has actually been doing this for several years. They do it in Africa, they do it in China, but they also do it in the U.S. Um, by kind of capitalizing on the fact that consumers are interested in local food and knowing their farmer and knowing where their food comes from. And, uh, and so Walmart has started to work with more local producers in the U.S. Um, in order to kind of fulfill this model. It, it actually also tells a great story to consumers who want to be more engaged in their communities and know where products are coming from. So switching over to um, the financial innovation space, many of you may be familiar with the crowdfunding model. Um, so crowdfunding is, is when a company actually taps the resources of an entire network uh, to raise money and in increments from a group of people. We see a lot of startups using this model, individuals using this model to actually um, build capital. Um, and the reason that this model is actually included in this analysis is because it's bringing diversity into the marketplace so that it's not just the largest companies that are able to succeed and get financing. Um, it's actually enabling uh, alternative ideas that might not otherwise attract mainstream investor attention to gain traction. And a lot of the ideas that are crowdfunded often have a community development angle or a social impact element. And so it's, it's kind of offending traditional investment power structures in a way and enabling new ideas to see the light of day. So one example of this in action is Community Force Capital. This is a company based out of Washington State. And uh, what they do is they provide an online platform to enable small businesses to source capital from those in their community. And so community members, they fund part of a larger loan to a small business by buying a square. And the, and the square is a $50 unit as part of this larger loan. And eventually, um, those that buy squares are paid back as that company succeeds. Um, so great model, and, uh, and it's interesting to see the different uh, businesses that are being enabled to succeed as a result. Another financial um, innovation model is one called innovative product financing. So this actually isn't a new model. It's really it's when customers are allowed to lease or rent an item that they wouldn't otherwise be able to afford or be able to buy outright. But the reason that we've featured it here is because innovative product financing is actually enabling um, environmental innovation to get more traction in the marketplace. And in particular, that's happening a lot in the solar energy space. So Sun Edison is a great example of this. They offer power purchase agreements to both business and retail customers. Um, and so there's no upfront cost of actually having to shell out a lot of money to buy uh, solar panels. This actually allows users to use the solar panel, pay for the energy that they produce and use, Meanwhile, Sudden Edison actually installs all of the equipment and maintains all of the equipment over time. Um, and so because of this model, we've actually seen solar becoming um, kind of a threat to the traditional utility um, energy model in the U.S. So um, pretty exciting to see that happen. So moving into the diverse impact space, these are models that are, are having maybe some social impact and environmental impact as well. Maybe they're bringing people together in different ways. Um, one really interesting model that we identified that you may not be familiar with is the alternative marketplace. So this occurs when a company circumvents the traditional method of transaction or they invent a new kind of transaction that unleashes untapped value. And so alternative marketplaces can reveal unused resources or they can disintermediate hierarchical systems um, and in some cases create new channels for exchange. Um, it's important to note that alternative marketplaces aren't always inherently more sustainable, but entrepreneurs are increasingly using this, this model in, 
in order to increase social and environmental impact. So one terrific example is a small business called One More Palette. Um, they're actually based out of Ohio, and they offer name your price shipping to small businesses that don't need an entire 18-wheeler truck to actually ship their product. They just need a spot in that truck. And so this actually enables clients to bid on empty truck space and for trucking companies to fill the empty spaces in their loads and increase their profits. But as a result, the entire kind of transportation uh, system becomes more efficient and the number of trucks on the road actually could end up decreasing because you're not just filling um, large trucks with one pallet. Uh, so really interesting use of this model. And next is, uh, is something we call the behavior change model. So convincing consumers to change their behavior is a significant part of the sustainability agenda. And, um, and business models that can stimulate behavior change for sustainability, it's a relatively new concept, but if those models can demonstrate that they can make a profit, uh, then we really could the changes in consumption patterns and uh, changes in impact on environmental resources well into the future. So this space is, is a really interesting one to watch. There honestly aren't that many companies that have been able to figure out how to change consumer behavior and get consumers to use less um, while also making a profit, but one that has done so and done so successfully is O-Power. So O-Power is, um, is a company that actually works with utility companies to help engage their customers to get them to use less energy. And they leverage proven behavior changing techniques, particularly they think about competition between one user of, um, of energy in, in one home versus everyone else on their block, everyone else in their neighborhood. And it kind of changes the way that people think about their energy use, and it's actually creating a lot more engagement between the consumer and the utility company. So there's a whole lot more stickiness there, stronger relationship, stronger engagement overall. Um, so I hope that we can see more of these models into the future. Um, I think it's, it's definitely challenging to figure it out, but um, I think we'll see more of them. And lastly, in the diverse impact category, uh, and this is actually the last model we're featuring today, it's the shared resource model. And so, of course, I'm sure quite a few of you have heard about the sharing economy, and that really means that we're enabling customers to access a product rather than owning it and use it only as needed. Um, and the reason that this model is interesting is because we think it enables more efficient and productive use of resources that might otherwise sit idle. We've seen it most often used in um, kind of the uh, hotel, uh, international hotel system. So we've seen Airbnb rise to the top. Um, we've also seen it a lot in car sharing, of course. And, you know, so many cities now have multiple car sharing services. One unique example that we came across in our research is a company called Phone. And Phone is actually trying to solve the challenge of internet accessibility for consumers when they're away from their home or their office. And it allows um, home Wi-Fi users to set up a, a safe Wi-Fi signal for others to use to a phone hotspot. And so once you become part of this network and this community, if you're traveling, you can use any phone hotspot. So there are now millions of phone hotspots around the world, and, um, and it's, it's kind of an example of communities of people coming together and, um, and, and sharing networks that exist instead of creating new ones. Um, I think overall, the success of the sharing economy models will be dependent upon scalability and kind of overcoming any objections that consumers might have to owning, um, that, sorry, to sharing something rather than owning it. So I think that the research from Globescan, it doesn't necessarily show what consumers prefer in, in terms of sharing goods or owning, but it does show that 84% of Americans believe that we need to consume less in order to preserve the environment for future generations. And so it's likely that an opportunity to produce less waste through sharing, um, but maintaining your consumption could actually be an attractive option for consumers. So. That's why we've got our eye on this model for the future. 
I'm actually going to pass the baton back over to Chris Coulter um, so that he can talk through some of the implications we're seeing overall from, from looking at the demand side research and the supply side models. Okay, thanks so much, Lindsay. So let's go to the first set of implications. Um, so what does all this mean? Well, first of all, we, we do know that, that American consumers are engaged and interested in a, and feel empowered to take action. They feel socially and environmentally conscious and committed, um, and they're also interested in these new types of business models that Lindsay referred to and how they're kind of interesting and cool in solving not only a consumer need of demand, but also addressing broader concerns that people are anxious about. So this is this is an exciting meeting place of the demand and supply side, but there's an early um, sense and evidence that, that this is the way forward together. Um, we also know that consumers are, there are, they prefer green, socially responsible products and services. They indicate the ways to pay um, and that they see certain models being quite appealing towards this end. There also is a sense that People understand they want to consume less. So there's a number of the models that Lindsay uh, took us through showcase how there's just a less impact on the environment and on society in some cases, and that these types of either shared economy or circular economy oriented models are quite appealing and feel very smart and intelligent to consumers. So that's, that addresses their sense that, they, that we need to change our habits and approaches, and they're open and ready for that. Further, there is definitely a sense that there's not a trade-off here between quality and impact, and that is one of the challenges that we all got ourselves into 20 years ago with the first set of green wave orientations. People are looking for very uh, high quality, high style, high touch, high design elements, and this is the, the, the exciting connection with some of the business models that allow for, allow for that element to come through. And they, we can't have any sort of compromise whatsoever on the, on the quality or style piece of the puzzle. Americans are looking for good pricing, of course, and we know that some new business models allow us to cut prices, and Lindsay identified a couple of them. And those sort of disruptions are exciting and appealing to Americans economically, but also the, the novelty of them are also important and the adoption rates in the U.S. of some of these are, are quite extraordinary and, and, up and, and very fast moving, even if we look just at the shared economy model perspective. And not all these models come about just because of consumers are demanding for it. We know that consumers respond to some of these things, but a lot of the drivers of the models that we pointed out relate to the technology that, that allows us to think this way the competitive context and pressures that business is under, and some of the disruptive um, perspective of new entrepreneurs, either the traditional entrepreneurs or social entrepreneurs, uh, with new ways to create value, to drive profits forward, and to jump into um, sectors that are a little bit perhaps uh, comfortable, such as the utility sector, which Lindsay oriented as well. And this, this next sort of slide identifies how all of these different models do connect with issues and which of the segments that we described are most relevant. And, and we can see across the board, when a closed loop production model, for example, has lots of positive impacts, it reduces costs, it increases engagement, it reduces environmental impact, and it's in response to some demand, that's a, a strong indication that this model is quite appealing, and it appeals to three of the segments of, of our four segments. So this is a, a very strong proposition these days. If we look at something that is a little less all-encompassing inclusive, it might be the behavior change model, and Lindsay referred to this as well. It addresses engagement, it certainly reduces environmental impact, but it only applies to two segments, a smaller group, and it's not as all-encompassing on its impact. The shared resource and shared economy model has lots of appeal and, um, and quite exciting to practicals and advocates in particular. So we have a matrix of the meeting of supply and demand. We have lots of complexity related to it, but lots of opportunity to try and make both progress on environmental and social issues 
and also be create new successful businesses based on new approaches and models that are often disruptive. Thanks, Chris. Um, so we've gone through quite a bit of data today. We've also talked through nine different business models. Um, so there's a lot of thinking um, here for everyone to reflect upon. Uh, what we wanted to do is make sure that we capture the five things that you can take away and keep in mind as you develop your thinking around business model innovation in the U.S. marketplace going forward. So first is just to consider the full set of relationships within your company's value chain to start uncovering opportunities for business model innovation. So look at how you engage with customers, how you engage with employees, your suppliers, your investors, and your community, and think about those transactions and how they happen because those are all opportunities for, uh, for business model innovation. Also, just a practical point, ensure that no matter what kind of business model innovation you're using, that you're still delivering practical benefits to your consumers, to your products and services. Pretty basic, but, um, but it's important to kind of stick to brass tacks, um, even when you're innovating. Next is that we really see that consumers want to connect with companies and brands at a much deeper level. And so if you are somehow um, providing social or environmental impact um, within your business model, you should feel free to communicate that transparently um, because it can allow for um, more of that connection to actually happen between the consumer and, and the company or brand. Next is to really realize the power of networks in building your business. Um, all of the data that GlobeScan has done indicates that there is a lot of demand for products that can kind of connect people with friends and family and social networks. And uh, so that's a, a, a good way to think about different business model innovation opportunities is thinking about um, capitalizing on networks and communicating through networks. And in the same vein, um, we also find that brands that embrace collaboration can actually experience deeper engagement um, on these, these issues of sustainability. In particular, we see this happening with, um, with the sharing economy and companies that actually start to embrace that rather than uh, reject that can actually reap rewards in the future. Um, so we hope that, uh, that our, our data and thinking will kind of help you get a better handle on, um, on business model innovation happening in the U.S. and what consumers are thinking about when it comes to sustainability. If you have any questions or if you'd like to explore any of the topics that we brought up um, on this webinar a little bit further, either from the standpoint of understanding the demand side data a little bit more or exploring business model innovation ideas and opportunities, please feel free to reach out to, uh, to Chris or to me. Our email addresses are here, and we would love to hear from you. So thank you so much, and, uh, and take care. Thank you.